Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, a researcher stumbles right into the middle of a botnet and documents everything that he finds. Plus, a mistake over at Facebook takes down countless websites, and then it's a big batch of your questions and our answers. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 97 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on February 14th, 2013. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the teacher, and the tech, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Alan, uh, today's pre-show was quite epic because we had a little extra time to kill while you resolved a jail outage. And I also overheard a conversation about a little Raspberry Pi action. So i got to ask you about that, too. Yeah. So we have a big show. Today we're going to talk about uh, these. Uh, the first story we're going to have is this Adobe security vulnerability. So we'll be getting to the news as well. In the feedback section, bunch of questions. But Alan, I think maybe the first thing I want to talk about is our new t-shirt we launched. It's kind of out of yes. order, but I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we, last week, we mentioned that we would be launching uh, a TechSnap 100 shirt. And it would be out on Tuesday, and we did. And within the first like six hours of the shirt, it uh, it sold the hundred minimum. So we thought we'd the way we're doing this is we the production run wouldn't even start until a hundred orders were met. We figured a hundred orders for episode one hundred, we'd guarantee a certain bulk right. amount by, that we by should buy. By guaranteeing that we would only run them if there was at least a hundred, it made the price for making them cheaper so that we could charge less for the shirts. And so we launched it on Tuesday. It's only going to be available for uh, 19 more days and four hours as of, of, as of this recording. So basically, right before episode 100, this uh, purchase opportunity will wrap up. We'll never run the shirt again. We have gotten a little feedback on the swearing, but again, guys, this is just for a limited time. We and had we a poll about that last week. It's your fault for not voting. Yeah, <laughs> we did have a poll. You're right. We put it to the community. Uh, and so the price is $13.37. It ships uh, internationally for like 8 bucks or 7 bucks. Ships uh, domestically for like 6 bucks or 5 bucks, something like that. And uh, if you put your order in in 19 days, you can get yourself a limited edition TechSnap 100 shirt and uh, celebrate reaching 100 episodes, which will undoubtedly be 100 episodes in a row. So that's pretty exciting. So thank you to everybody who's bought them, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes, or you can go to teespring.com slash techsnap100 and uh, buy it directly. Yep. Uh, but anyways, and yes, uh, there is a little QR code bug, but we're working on that. Mm-hmm. We know, we know. All right, Alan, before we jump into the news, tell me about your adventures in Raspberry Pi land, because if I'm not mistaken, it probably didn't involve Linux, did it? Uh, well, at first. Uh, so, yes, uh, I had complained previously about... Um, how hard it was to get a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so someone who had bought an A and then bought a B sent me their A. Which is uh, so cool. A text and viewer, which was, yeah, it was very nice of them. I offered to pay for the shipping and they wouldn't hear of it. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I got it and I was, oh, I didn't have a power supply for it. Anyway, I finally got the power supply sorted out, mm-hmm. hooked it up, and uh, I started with the uh, Rasp- Raspbian, which is the Raspberry Pi version of Debian, because that was what was on the SD card that it came with. Right, so I booted up to see what the out of the box experience was like. It's got a little configuration tool that pops up, and I yeah. played with it a little bit. Um, and then I went and got a different SD card and loaded that up with the FreeBSD image uh, from RaspberryPi.org. They have a post there with a ah. quite recent uh, 10 current build of FreeBSD that works on the Raspberry Pi. So I plugged that in and tried that as well, and it worked uh, right out of the box as well. Oh, very nice. Well, I had it running the Debian thing. Um, <laughs> I, I installed iPerf, yeah, uh, which is a network we, testing. We tool. talked about that last week, didn't we? Right. Um, and so I wanted to see what the perfor- well, because I'd heard bad things about the performance of the Ethernet adapter because, because it's, it's USB, connected right? by a USB. Yeah, I had uh, so I played with it a little bit, and I found that uh, for sending, I could send sixty-four megabits out of the hundred, okay. and it could receive the full one hundred. Oh, well, awesome. So then I tried UDP, right? Because that was TCP. Okay. So I tried UDP, uh, and you know, when I attempted to do 100, it sent uh, like 670 or so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I amped it up and said, try to send 125 to see if it would get higher, and it got a bit higher. And then I tried 150, and it crashed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it just went, it locked it up. <laughs> it, like all, all the lights, uh, like the Ethernet connection dropped, and the screen went blank, and just the, the Raspberry Pi just crashed. Uh, uh, uh. 
So did you have it hooked up? So did you say you had it hooked up to your TV? Yeah, so uh, I didn't have a DVI to HDMI cable to be able to hook it up. Oh, so you just need HDMI monitor. in. <laughs> so I, well, actually, I had it connected via the uh, component output, the old like NTSC low resolution connection, oh. because that's what the cable I had handy and okay. ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I've ordered the HDMI to DVI cable I need because my TV is old and it's commercial, so it actually doesn't have HDMI. Mm. It has a whole bunch of BNC type connectors mm-hmm. and a DVI port. Yeah. So I'm going to use the HDMI to DVI adapter to hook it up anyway. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I play with it a bit. It seems uh, fairly useful so far. <laughs> That's and, really uh, cool. Once uh, I'm right, I cross compiled a newer version of FreeBSD to put on the SD card that fixes a bug that when you tried to update the ports tree, it would crash. Oh. Anyway, so I'm going to actually try to see what I can actually get running on this Raspberry Pi. Dude, that's so cool. We have some Raspberry Pi uh, enthusiasts in our live chat room right there. Uh, Shane Kufel, who's mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's developed a couple of Android apps and a Sim- or an Android app and a Symbian app for us. He says uh, he's got a project where he's cracking uh, Office documents. He's got 11, I believe, Raspberry Pis in his house right now that he's working with. <laughs> I'm wondering what the power efficiency is like for that versus well, like doing it on a, a you know, big machine like I could, you know <laughs> the machine i was cross compiling freebsd for arm on was 24 cores <laughs> right a dual xeon e5 right right let it do the heavy lifting yeah yeah that's funny still took a long time it seems to take longer to cross compile for arm than it does to actually uh compile natively I suppose so it makes sense normal well uh so um that's cool i look forward to hearing other little things you managed to accomplish but i i have been thinking a lot about the raspberry pi when in context of replacing my boxy boxes in my living room i've been thinking yeah i was wondering because well my media center type machine the machine that i play the videos on in my living room yeah is an old like pentium d so it's actually like pentium 4 architecture so it uses yeah. a lot of power, it yeah. makes a lot of noise, yeah. and replacing that with the Raspberry Pi might be pretty useful. And maybe tossing like right XBMC now, on there or something? Yeah. Uh, although, yeah, I want XBMC because right now I'm using my ATI Remote Wonder, which is a, an RF-based remote control mm-hmm. to control my TV, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't want to lose that functionality. Yeah. Yeah, RF is nice. Uh, all right, Al. Well, that's a good little uh, good little distraction. And uh, uh, Shane Kufel, the, the guy that has all the Raspberry Pis, was wondering if uh, you tried the Clang compiler under BSD because on the Pi, under uh, Debian, it does not work. Do you know? Did you try uh, that? I haven't tried that, but again, you know, that's... Down the road. I don't know that much about embedded architectures in ARM, so I'm not really futzing around with too much of that. Maybe uh, maybe soon you'll have it uh, hosting uh, a video stream or something. I'd love to see what kind of server thing you come up with it, too. Well, it can run Java because they do the, um, what do you call it, uh, Minecraft on there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but wow, it really doesn't have enough RAM to try to run a yeah. video server on it. I see. That was my conclusion when I started thinking about the Media Center is uh, I have some very high bit rate. 1080p files, and I was almost wondering if I should well, wait no, the, the next rev. No, the 1080p files might be okay if you have the proprietary... Well, I guess Broadcom's open sourcing the driver for the video, right? Yeah, if and it if could do GPU. That, yeah, yeah, because the G, like that was the whole point of the Raspberry Pi, is that it had the ability to play your 1080p content. I'm thinking, though, like a, I'm thinking music. like a 14, 16 megabit MKV mm. file. I just don't... That I don't know if it's going to have the horsepower. That might be mm. pretty high. We'll yeah. have to see. We'll see. But yeah, the GPU is supposed to be pretty good on it. If anybody out there has tried it uh, as their media center and done really high-res video files, uh, I'd love to know. Email techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Alan, but should yeah, we I'd jump into our first story? Like this yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, so sure. uh, a, little, a little security news from Adobe this week. And uh, we're starting off with a little Adobe news. It's, it seems to either be Oracle or Adobe these days. <laughs> right? They're just, I don't know. They're in a bad way. Uh, this one, Yeah. But Adobe's doing a better job of getting the updates out there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's they true. They don't make us wait until a certain day of the week or, or so, a certain pre-scheduled date for an update. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but maybe Oracle could take a page from Adobe's book on uh, some of this stuff. And just in some Possibly. ways. Yeah. But I, honestly, the biggest thing Oracle should do to get people to update more often is stop making the Java installer try to install the Ask toolbar. Yeah, stop. Exactly, exactly. Stop it, bundling adware with Java, and so, people wouldn't be afraid to update it. This is why IT shops turn off the automatic update, because they don't want their users inadvertently installing that crap on their desktops. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's a huge problem. It's, and thankfully, it Adobe no isn't sense. doing that. It's, like, it's just horrible. 
Yeah. So what's going on with this Adobe story? Yeah. So in this one, uh, Adobe made a, a critical announcement and a f- update of Flash uh, APSB uh, 13-04. So this is their fourth vulnerability announcement of 2013. Okay. Uh, and it fixes CVE 2013-06-33 and 34. Uh, so the first one is a buffer overflow that could allow remote code execution. Mm. And it was reported to Adobe by Kaspersky Labs. Possibly because Kaspersky found evidence of this being exploited in the wild. So somebody could visit a website and this could just arbitrarily execute code on their machine. Yes. Also, they were found uh, the flash files embedded into Word documents and being emailed to people. Uh-huh. Surprise, surprise there, And huh? so somebody got one of these, knew it was a virus, sent it to Kaspersky, and they were like, oh, hey, Adobe, here's the flaw that they're using to... Uh, Exploit your stuff, and this is this is affecting modern versions of Flash. Yes, uh, all the newest ones. Yeah, uh, it's also uh, slightly troubling to see from Adobe's bulletin here the number of versions of Flash that are considered current. Uh huh. Right. Yes, yeah, they have. Yeah. It's it's quite a mess. And then there's uh, 0634, which is uh, remote code execution and memory corruption that could cause a denial of service attack, like a. Deny service on the local machine. Uh, and this was reported in uh, Adobe worked with uh, the Shadow Server Foundation, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But they're basically, uh, they track botnets and uh, viruses and stuff like that on the internet. Uh-huh. And mostly report uh, bots and command and control servers to the owners of the network so that they can have them taken down. Okay. Uh, but also Lockheed Martin's Computer Incident Response Team uh, was credited uh, in the uh, vulnerability announcement. That's Both of uh, CVE 0633 and 0634 were giving a score of 9.3 out of 10. That's, uh, that's about, might as well just give them a 10 at that point. <laughs> Not quite, but yes. <laughs> well, remember, the Java ones were all 10 out of 10. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So a lot of, do- like, well, I think the reason these are lower mostly is because you had to open the Word document that was an attachment on a malicious email, which you should have known better than to do in the first place, Mm -hmm. and then have Word execute the Flash. Uh, But like I was saying with the version numbers, uh, Adobe recommends users update their products uh, to the latest versions. That's 11.5.502.146 for Windows or Mac. Oh, sorry. That's... Anyway, sorry. The... Latest version. That's the uh, old version. Where's the yeah. new version? <laughs> the, la- the, rec- uh, the updates to the latest version. So you have. Uh, boy, this, what's, what's yeah. hard about it is they so put yeah, it in the same have, line. 11.5.502.149 should be the yeah, latest. Yeah, it's the newest one. Uh, yeah. And that's for Windows and Mac. Uh, if you still have 10.3, you should upgrade to 10.5 or 11.5 as well. Just get to the latest version. Uh, yeah, um, um, but eleven point two was upgraded to eleven point two point two zero two point two six two. That's uh, sorry. The yeah, Adobe Flash for Linux uh, got an update, but it was only to eleven point two. They don't actually I, have eleven point five for Linux. I completely agree with the chat room. Adobe's versioning system here is an absolute mess. The idea that different platforms have different version of the exact same thing, but then yet can be susceptible to the same vulnerabilities. How is anybody outside well, of Adobe keeping this straight? Basically, all of the Flash versions are vulnerable. And yeah, for Linux, they just went to the, the tag that they have, like the latest version Linux had, and applied their patch to it, but not applying all the other fixes or all the other upgrades that exist in Flash 10 point, or 11.5. Because Fla- uh, Linux only gets up to 11.2. But yeah, Google Chrome is 11.5, but they have an entirely different versioning system. The, after 11.5... They have only two digits instead of three digits, right? So if you're on Windows or Mac, like with Firefox or Safari or anything like that, you have 11.5.502.149. But Chrome for Windows, Mac, and Linux is 11.5.31.139. And if you have Flash for Internet Explorer 10 on Windows 8, uh, you'll automatically get upgraded to (laughs) 11.3.379.14. Android 4 devices are 11.1.115.37. Uh, uh, Android uh, 2 and 3 
devices get 11.1.111.32. And so, and you remember one thing I'm not totally clear on, on how this works, and you kind of, you kind of piqued my interest when you mentioned the Chrome thing. So, so if I have Chrome on my computer, I'm using the built-in Flash player that's integrated into Chrome, right? I'm not yes. using Flash installed standalone on my desktop, so I actually have to wait for a separate update from Google to Chrome yes. to fix that. Yes. Ah, but, that's uh, a t- it's already out. Okay. Like it, uh, so Google's know. on top of it, it seems like. Yes. Well, basically, yeah. I, I, well, because it's not like Google's developing the version of Flash that's right. bundled. They just, Adobe sent Google the new version and Google releases it right away. And then, but they have to ship a new version of Chrome. Of Chrome. Yeah, but they do that like every day anyway. It seems like it. Yeah, it just seems ridiculous. It seems, it yeah. does not seem like a good set setup. But, yeah, and, you know, having this many decimals in the version number doesn't make very much sense either. Adobe needs to just shut like down. Eleven point five point five zero two point one four nine. Seriously, you know what they need to do is open source Flash and move on. I yeah, wish they uh, would. Well, the funny uh, story came up. I tagged it for last instead of TechSnap, but Adobe gave the rights to the Computer History Museum to release version one point zero, the source code for version one point zero of Photoshop. Really? Yes. And do you know what license? I don't know. Hmm. But uh, the the source code is is viewable anyway. It might be under a license where you can't use it for anything, but you can look at it, which is you know interesting if you want to read it. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take a look during the segment right. break. But the chat room just pointed me to uh, another bad news story for Adobe. A zero day PDF for for Adobe Reader came out, according to research uh, FireEye uh, research firm FireEye is releasing today a uh, zero day vulnerability that's being exploited in the wild. So I'll read that, and if it looks interesting, I'll toss it in the roundup. Cool. Wow. Uh, anyway, news. so yeah, both vulnerabilities are being exploited in the wild uh, in yeah. February. That's this month. Uh, Remote code execution vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah. Uh, interestingly, both CVE numbers were actually allocated in December, <laughs> on December 18th. Well, Although, we know you're going to need these, so... Uh, well, yeah, but they would have been allocated to the researchers, not to Adobe. Ah. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, although the CVE database has a little disclaimer that says... The entry creation date may reflect when the CVE ID was allocated or reserved and does not necessarily indicate that this vulnerability was disclosed, right. shared with the affected vendor, publicly disclosed, or updated at that date. Yeah. But it seems that whoever found this vulnerability found it in December and told Adobe about it some point after that, and then Adobe fixed it. So Adobe could have known about this for a while and not fixed it as quickly as we might hope. Hmm. But yeah, both vulnerabilities uh, made use of embedding a .swf file into a Word document and then tricking users into opening it. Uh, although in a future version of Flash, I think 11.6, Adobe is going to add an extra thing there so that when Flash is run from within a Word doc or a PDF or something, you get an extra pop-up saying, are you sure you want to run this? So that it can't be run silently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... You know, users are so trained to click yes on everything anyway, I don't know if it'll do any good. And the second vulnerability, uh, 0634, was also used in direct attacks. So basically, the SWF file hosted on a website and embedded somewhere, you know, watering hole attack or whatever to run the exploit against people. And like you said, you found it interesting that uh, Lockheed Martin... Uh, his name came up in the vulnerability disclosure. Mm-hmm. And some people re- were freaking out, meaning, oh, it meant Lockheed Martin got atta- hacked or whatever. But it's more likely, it, that's, not, uh, that's not impossible, but it's more likely that somebody at Lockheed got one of these you know, spear phishing emails with the, the naughty attachment, and their computer response team was like, hey, oh. let's take a look at this and figure so out what it's trying to do. I was wondering if maybe Lockheed was getting in the malware business, but that makes more sense. That's possible but it's more likely that this was targeted against them and they reported the vulnerability to adobe so that flash would be updated so yeah. that it yeah that but yes sense. uh you know we have a story in the roundup about the defense contractors getting mm-hmm. into business of writing malware mm-hmm. yeah we'll get to that i found that uh i found that post you mentioned about uh, photoshop being submitted to uh, the uh, computer museum uh, and you can actually download the 1.01 source code right there from the Computer History Museum's website, which is really yep. cool. It's a lot of source code, too. It's like 100 or 200 and some odd thousand lines plus 68,000 lines of assembly code. Yep, yep. 75% of the code's in Pascal. 15% is in 68,000 assembler language, and the rest is data of various sorts. 
and they have a bunch of I actually I've used every version of Photoshop because my mom uh was a graphic artist that she has been, you know, ever since computers became a thing, so she always had Photoshop. So I I remember using this on the old black and white Mac that she had. So that takes me back. Wow, I guess I'm old. How do you do color Photoshop on a black and white Mac? <laughs> I don't know how she did that. That's a great Well, actually, to be honest with you, I know a lot of her early stuff was black and white. Mm, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah print or whatever i guess yeah. that makes sense. I, I remember being it distributed on a floppy disk too gosh i guess i'm old yep. Interesting. well no, i remember floppy disk too and i'm not as old as you <laughs> thanks <Evan. laughs> any other thoughts on the adobe you're story? only a couple of years older than me I guess. <laughs> i'm getting old now too actually yeah yeah now now you got yourself a house you're getting proper old <laughs> yeah any other thoughts on that story nope all right well then uh, this next story reminds us to be aware of the trolls doesn't it yep <laughs> what's this bit. about uh so shadow server who we talked about would they uh they run honey pots and stuff and basically try to find botnets so they have computers that they purposely try to get infected with botnet uh mm-hmm. clients and then try to find out where the command and control server is what commands are being sent to the bots ah, and things like that track it back yeah and if you run some servers uh you can sign up they have a mailing list where you tell them your ip blocks and they will email you anytime they find bots running in your IP blocks. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was a, it was a bigger thing when I used to run a, an IRC hosting company. Sure. So it would tell me when somebody was trying to run a command and control server off an account uh, on my server. And so I could shut it down and so on. And uh, they have a bunch of other stuff on there as well. Uh, but anyway, this is a, a blog post from a, it's a couple of months old now. But uh, they found that while analyzing the commands received by some of the bots... Uh, that were part of the botnet, they noticed a kind of disturbing pattern. Basically, the bot commands, which are normally separated by pipes in this particular botnet, uh, included a bunch of JavaScript code. Hmm. And, uh, Why would it need JavaScript code? Well, they, what they figured was at Shadow Server, they have this web interface where they get all the reports about the botnets, right? And that's how they browse to this information that they collect. And they thought, hey... Is it the guys that run the botnet injecting this code here uh-huh. so that in our web interface, that'll get executed? Yeah. Because what the JavaScript code did was draw an iframe that uh-huh. went to another website that would run Java and ActiveX exploits. Mm-hmm. So their assumption right away was that the botmaster is trying to infect the people that are spying on his botnet. They figured out they're being watched. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and once the exploit is successfully run... It drops a password stealer that <laughs> goes through your registry and your home directory and steals your saved passwords for Qt FTP, Shell FXP, oh, FileZilla, Smart ouch. FTP, Firefox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes and gets the goodies. So it steals all your saved passwords, encrypts that information, and sends it back to a different CNC server. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they're like, so the guys at Shadow Server thought this was an, an exploit against their reporting interface. Or any because you know the people that research these botnets, they're not writing a commercial application to be designed designed to be used by other people. They're uh, writing their own tools, right? Right. So they don't always, you know, do the same level of input validation that you might do right. uh, on a, on an app that's meant to have customers. Using well, they're usually it. building it as they're building it as they go. Themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a tool for themselves. They add a feature and, as they need it. Yeah, and so they don't always have all the input validation they should, and because of that, it could cause this JavaScript code to get executed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, it also appears that the malware that was being dropped had already been submitted to a bunch of the uh, malware analysis sites like VirusTotal and MalWR.com. Oh, really? Uh, Because what that does is actually checks the malware against basically this giant database of known virus scanners and sees whether they detect it or not. Mm -hmm. And when they don't, the sample gets sent to that uh, virus AV company so that they can design a, a signature to detect it in the future. Um, but they found that somebody had submitted the virus or a version of it and then later submitted a different version that had a lower detection rate. <laughs> well, how, do they, how do they accomplish that? Well, their websites. Anybody can go there and submit a virus to the website. And oh, the, okay. the whole point is that this is where researchers submit all this stuff so that they can collaborate about it, right? Right, right. Uh, well, they found that, this, that somebody had submitted one version and then a couple of days later submitted another version that wasn't detected as well. Mm. This led to speculation that the author of the malware may have been uploading various revisions <laughs> in order to make it less detectable. 
This guy right? had some time on his hands. Well, that or it could be another researcher that just found multiple versions of it. Oh, yeah. So, no. We, from this perspective, it's hard to tell right. what's actually happening. So we just have what they thought and what they found out later and so yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, but there's an update to that post where they found that uh, it seems that actually what was actually happening was that one bot master was attempting to exploit the other bot master and take over his botnet. <laughs> So the the exploit wasn't actually targeted at the researchers, but at the owner of the botnet. <laughs> so so somebody had taken over, you know, had basically reverse engineered one of the bots and was having it try to send stuff so that the web interface of for, for controlling the botnet would infect the guy that controls yeah. the botnet and steal yeah. all his passwords, right? So that, that the whole botnet could be taken over. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That would be the greater prize, right? Let, let somebody else build the whole botnet network and infrastructure and then just take it over and then just make yeah, it yours. merge it into your own. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it still suggests an interesting concept where the bot master, who is being observed by the researchers, uh, reverses the roles and starts uh, observing the activities of the watchers, right? To keep an eye on the researchers and what they're finding out and, you know. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely uh, false data and stuff. It's definitely one of those things you you don't really appreciate the fact that sometimes these different malware authors or botnet masters, whatever you want to call them, they sometimes go after each other. Yes. (laughs) Well, especially you know some of these botnets are making serious money off spam, uh, um, click fraud, and ads and stuff like that. Hmm. (laughs) The uh, the live chat room. You guys know we do uh, TechSnap live on Thursdays at one p.m. Pacific, uh, four Eastern, right? And uh, what is that UTC? Twenty one hundred. And the chat room, the chat room is just going crazy with uh, uh, some great suggestions for titles. You can help us uh, title these episodes, Alan. You know, one of the things that uh, they're calling they're calling it a botnet war, and it, it almost yep. could be right. You could have your botnets go after this guy's botnets. <laughs> yep. Well, that's that's pretty good. Um, and the uh, updates are in line in that post that Alan's linked to in the show notes. Uh, any other thoughts on that one? Nope. All right, well, go read that. That's a good read. All right, yes. Alan, well, let's hit, the, uh, let's hit the pause button right here and thank this week's sponsor of the TechSnap program, and that is GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy has been a longtime supporter of the TechSnap program, and they are offering a new promo code that will take 28% off your entire order. You're getting a renewal. Nice. You're, getting a, you're getting maybe a .TV. You know, you're getting yourself something special. Maybe you're getting some hosting. Use our code GO28. Off too. Now it's twenty eight yep. because you're saving twenty eight percent. So go twenty eight. Yeah. So if you off missed two. last week where we offered you forty seven percent off, well, and you you're kicking that. yourself. At least you can still get twenty eight percent off. Yeah, twenty eight percent still pretty good if you use the code go twenty yep. eight off two. Or we still have tech two ninety five for two dollars and ninety five. Yep. If you're buying a new coms. domain that's yeah. a dot com, you can get it for two dollars ninety five cents. That go twenty eight off two though. I mean, that is a great deal for renewals. The twenty eight off two one is great because it works for renewals. It's hot. It's hot. We're getting some hosting. Yeah. Maybe do a VPS. Almost, almost no registrar ever offers a discount on renewals. I know because that's the whole business model is to yeah. sell you the domain cheap and then make the money on the renewals. Well, we're we're lucky. We're lucky because not everybody gets these discount codes, but because we've been with yes. GoDaddy for a long time and our audience supports this show. And, you know, just by visiting the links in our show notes, you let GoDaddy, GoDaddy know you're watching and at least, you know, we're telling you yep. about them. So that's a great way to support the show. But if you use our discount codes, they'll keep giving us these great discount codes and we exactly. can keep offering you a great awful offer. So go 28 off two when you check out to save 28% or tech 295 to get a dot com for $2.95. Ooh! Oh, thank you to GoDaddy.com for supporting this yes, week's episode. Thank you. All right, Alan, let's move on to the story. It sounds like, from what I read, that Facebook was responsible for websites that w- weren't related to Facebook going offline. Am I following Not this? Not offline. Facebook was stealing all their traffic. <laughs> what? Tell me about this. Uh, so, an error at Facebook basically made it impossible to visit a very large number of websites. I'm not liking the way this sounds at all. Well, basically, uh, if you were signed into Facebook or had a Facebook cookie at all, and the website you were trying to go to had Facebook Connect, yeah. you would be redirected to a Facebook error page upon visiting the site. So they supposedly so, have almost a billion users. And you figure yeah. a lot so, of websites yeah. use Facebook almost Connect. Everybody, yeah, almost everybody has a Facebook account. Uh, I've never used Facebook Connect on a website, but I have an account, so that's enough to, to trigger this error. Yeah, and if you've got the cookie <clears throat> active, right, if you've been logged in, jeez. Yeah. Yeah, it was some type of error or mistake in the code or the Facebook Connect widget caused users trying to visit 
external sites uh, that had Facebook Connect to be redirected to a Facebook error page, not when they tried to log in with Facebook Connect, but when they just tried to visit a page that included the Facebook code, the JavaScript. And you got this really meaningless generic error message, an error has occurred, please try again later. Yeah. Uh, some sites were reporting that if you went to Facebook and logged out, you wouldn't get the error anymore, but some people said that they were still getting it. And, you know, I was getting it, and I've never used Facebook Connect, but I do have a Facebook account, so yeah. I would have had the cookie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the outage caused a huge number of sites to basically have all their users redirected to Facebook instead <laughs> of their own page. <laughs> so if you tried to load abc.com, BuzzFeed, Capital.fm, CNN, Daily Mail, which is a popular uh, tabloid in the UK, ESPN, Etsy, Fox News, Gawker, Geico, HBO, Hollywood.com, The Huffington Post, Hulu, InfoWorld, MSNBC, NBC News, News.com.au, The NFL.com, Kickstarter, OKCupid, okay, uh, People.com, Pinterest, Reddit, Slate, <laughs> All World, Swagbox, The Sydney Melbourne Herald, TED.com to watch some educational videos. The Los Angeles Times, the New Zealand Herald, the Washington Post, <laughs> Vulture.com, Weather.com, Wiki Answers, WordPress.com, Exogene, uh, Yahoo, or Yugatech, oh you were redirected to Facebook. God. Wow. I'm so glad I didn't have that crap on my site. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is – so a topic that's come up in, in Coder Radio is – you know, when you're building your when you're building your site or you're building your app, and you depend on a third party architecture for authentication or for whatever it might be, when they go down, this is what happens. Yeah. In this case, you know, when Facebook is just down, yeah. it just makes your site load really slow, right? Because right? it's trying to load the, you know, which is it still depends bad. whether that that external widget is um, is loaded uh, synchronously or asynchronously, right? If it, if Depending where the JavaScript is, it may stop everything after that JavaScript from loading on the page. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of them will involve basically not being triggered until the whole page is loaded and then load the Facebook Connect part. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think Facebook Connect works like that. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, sometimes if the website's down, it'll cause your website to be, take a really long time to load, which gives a bad user experience and so on. Um, but in this case... Uh, some kind of error on Facebook's side was causing Facebook to literally redirect your users to their website. That seems like a problem. You can't yeah. have you can't have that be the outcome yeah. of an outage. You I mean you can have? Well, this uh, wasn't I, an outage. This was some kind of error. error or, right. Say, well, Facebook I'm, hasn't really explained what happened. Oh yeah, I'm, but outage, some code it was an that shouldn't have got for, pushed into production got pushed into production. It was an outage for CNN and for LA Times and all those guys. It caused them well, to have an outage in a sense. Kind of. They lost a lot of their traffic. Yeah. If you, if you had never been to Facebook, you wouldn't have got, been affected. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's probably only right. a handful of people. But yeah, so. it shows the risk involved in relying on third-party services for things like authentication, but also just the risk of embedding any third-party code on your website, especially when that code could change without notice. Right? Like if you're embedding jQuery from Google, you can embed a specific version and you will know that that version is not going to change and introduce a new bug somehow. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the Facebook code, you're not saying I'm going to embed the Facebook API version 1.1 or something. Right. You're embedding something that Facebook is arbitrarily going to change whenever they feel like it. Yeah. And, and there's yeah. an extra risk there. Yeah. You know, there's enough risk of, of embedding the Facebook code in your website. But the fact that Facebook could randomly break that at any time is an additional risk that you have to consider. I'm surprised, actually, this hasn't happened before. I mean, they have a pretty good reliability, but well, yeah, they've had, they've had outages before. But again, those don't those don't steal your visitors from your website, <laughs> right. deprive you of ad yeah. revenue. You're right. You're right. That makes but a huge freaking error difference. That wasn't an, an outage caused your traffic to be stolen and probably hurt those websites. Uh, advertising revenue for that hour or so that that was happening. Oh, yeah, or they could have been e-commerce sites or, I mean, yeah. yeah, wow. Or like Kickstarter. Kickstarter had an outage, so maybe Kickstarter right. didn't, you know, they didn't have any new projects launched during that time or, or whatever. People couldn't make a bid on a project, so. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Al, should we jump to the next story? Sure. Now, if I'm correct, this one could affect some POP3 and SMTP servers depending on which libraries nope. they use? Is uh, this no, this will affect uh, any machine with curl installed, specifically uh, web apps that make use of curl. Oh. 
Jeez, that's quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, basically, if you're using like PHP on shared web hosting, mm -hmm. which lots of people are, mm -hmm. there's like a 99% chance it has curl installed. Yeah. And if it's not been updated to the latest version, you could be vulnerable. Jeez. All Although right, so it turns out you're not vulnerable if you happen to have a rather old version as well. <laughs> Huh. So basically, it was introduced in 7.26 and fixed in 7.29. Oh, okay. So if you have an older <laughs> version or a newer version, you're okay. But yeah. in that, that small span there, you're in trouble. So what's going on? <clears throat> so libcurl is basically a library for dealing with URLs. And it does stuff like HTTP, FTP, SSH, SFTP, POP3, SMTP, uh, IMAP, RTSP, RTMP, and so on and so on and so on. And it's very commonly found on web servers and in uh, PHP scripts and so on because it's, in, it's a very easy way to deal with getting content from other websites. Like, you know, if, you're, if your website, say, uses an RSS feed to read information from Twitter, yeah. it probably does that with curl. Mm -hmm. uh, because curl also lets you do things like uh, posts and put and have cookies and stuff like that that are a lot harder to do manually. Mm-hmm. But it allows you to, yeah, scrape content or interact with an API. Like my biggest use of curl is dealing with connecting to remote APIs, like for PayPal and Stripe.com and, and Google and so on, right? Mm -hmm. And reading RSS feeds and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, the problem stems from the way that curl handles certain headers when it's processing the POP3 and SMTP protocols. Oh, uh, so, okay. Uh, when curl connects to a POP3 server, and tries to, uh, you can have it negotiate um, SASL Digest MD5 authentication, right? Which is a way of uh, basically double hashing the password so that neither side has to know what the password is in plain text. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, and basically, curl reads that response from the POP3 server mm -hmm. into a fixed length buffer of 128 bytes. Because it assumes that the response from the server isn't going to be any bigger than that. And on a regular mail server, it wouldn't be. But someone, if, if your web app is using curl, someone could cause your curl to connect to a fake server that does return a longer response. Yeah. That would overflow that buffer. Of course. Right? And that would allow it to overwrite memory outside of what that buffer is supposed to be and potentially lead to remote code execution. So you're saying that didn't cross the developer's mind? <laughs> <laughs> Sanitize right, your input. Think, right, yeah, they didn't think about um, the fact that somebody could make your curl connect to a malicious POP3 server. Right. Why would anybody? I mean, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of how email was designed. Why would anybody ever do anything malicious with this? Yes. Uh, so the most common vector for this attack is that by default, curl will follow redirects. Right. Uh huh. So, if, for example, uh, on your website you have, say it's a forum, and you have a system where people can enter a URL and it'll download the image and post it as their avatar on the forum or something. Yeah. Well, the, basically that takes that user-provided URL and sends it to curl. Well, since I'm the one inputting that URL, I can make that URL a redirect to pop3 colon slash slash my evil pop3 server. Right. That will cause your curl to connect to my fake POP3 server, mm -hmm. which injects the, re the remote code execution and, and you know, re okay. executes okay. code as whatever user executes the PHP code right. on your website. Right. Which would give me access to read the config file for your forum, get the SQL username and password, and dump your database and steal it. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh if you don't expect to ever receive a redirect when you're writing code that uses curl or libcurl, there's uh, a command line flag or uh, uh, a flag you can set in the, your, when you call libcurl mm -hmm. to say don't follow redirects. Uh, also, there's a config variable uh, curl ops reader protocols where you can specify which protocols you will accept a redirect to. Right? So if you go to an HTTP website and there's a redirect, 90% of the time or more, that redirect is going to point to another HTTP site, and that's fine. But you can say, you know, if the redirect is to a POP3 site, don't follow it. Only, yeah. only follow redirects that go to HTTP or HTTPS. Yeah. Because the redirect shouldn't go to 
FTP or POP3 in most cases, right? Right, right. That seems like a no. That seems like a no-brainer. Right. <clears throat> wow. But anyway, so, the, the vulnerability announcement is linked there and uh, has details on the version numbers that are affected and so on. So yeah, if you have a semi-recent build of curl, you're probably affected. It's funny yeah. because Shane in the chat room was like, oh, I'll be right back. Uh, I got to go patch. <laughs> we have people patching in real time as they watch. I love it. All right. Well, any other thoughts I don't know on how old those versions that they're talking about are. Yeah. How often does Curl release an update? I mean, they've kind of gotten to... Well, there have been uh, quite a bit of active development lately because they added things like RTSP and RTMP. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. So we can go out and get like little RTSP video segment files or what would it... What I'm not it? exactly sure how it works. That's, uh, that could be interesting though for some back-end video capturing stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, yeah. And it also has other features like uh, NTLM authentication. and But yeah, like mine supports for protocols, uh, dict, uh, which is um, some kind of dictionary, file, FTP, FTPS, gopher, HTTP, HTTPS, IMAP, IMAPS, POP3, POP3S, RTSP, SCP, SFTP, SMTP, SMTP over SSL, Telnet, TFTP, all kinds of stuff. So you need to get curl and libcurl 729.0 or, 729 or newer. Yeah. Uh, and if you're running uh, not affected, is 7260 and seven and anything before? Uh, anything before 270. Uh, 7.26. Yep. Uh, yep. Right. So 7.26 is vulnerable, I think. But anything before it is not. Before it isn't, yes. Because right. that's when they introduced uh, the bug that allowed this to happen. And anything after, anything starting with 7.26.0, 7.26.0 is vulnerable. To, yes. Up until 7.29.0, 7. 7. which is brand new. Right. <laughs> okay. Got it. <laughs> the chairman was asking, so I want to make sure we got that right. Uh, all right, Al, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no. It's just... Uh, Interesting to, you know, people, I don't think Curl's code for interfacing with POP3 gets tested all that often. Probably not. It's probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it just goes back, though, to... Matthew, you should send an email to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com asking what TFTP is, and I'll talk about it one time, because it's actually go. an interesting protocol, uh, and mostly in what it's used for. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've, uh, yeah, I've got a few stories using TFTP. Yeah, basically, if you're dealing with like routers and firmware and stuff, yeah, exactly. You know, yep. with TFTP. Uh, Alan, before we jump into the feedback segment, I just want to remind folks that one way they can always support the show and the network in whole, this is especially great if you watch a few of our shows, is with our affiliate links over at the bottom of jupiterbroadcasting.com. Just click there before you shop at Amazon or eBay or Netflix or Newegg or ThinkGeek or Best Buy or Mint.com, which is free but awesome, or Audible, which is freaking amazing, uh, some great yep. books on there. And we also have Chrome and Firefox extensions, which not only automatically take your shopping session, but take it for more sites than we have listed down there, like Monoprice. We have a few affiliates where the yes. link system doesn't work because i i bought all the stuff to wire my house at monoprice whoa <laughs> nice thanks alan well uh so uh, that's a great way to support uh, the show and the network is by using those affiliate links before you shop but alan with all of the news done that means it's time for the tech snap feedback Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or starting a thread in our subreddit at links.techsnap.tv. Alan, before we get to the emails, you'd notice that Red Hat's doing some hiring and you thought that might be uh, relevant to some of our audience interest, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, well, it was not just that they were doing hiring, but it's uh, some detail about what they put into the process. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, so there's a series of articles at uh, Dice.com, and that was highlighted on Slashdot. Slashdot. And uh, it talks about things like, um, you know... Looking for people uh, with strong technical for skills. Technical skills, but uh, they put a premium on people who have know what Red Hat is. Taking time to research its business, or yeah. That when they write the resume specifically tailored for this particular job at Red Hat rather than just spamming out the same resume to 100 companies? You know, that's I have a lot of success with that in my client business. That's how I land a lot of the client well, yeah, deals is like, targeting. Yeah, well, because, you know, I when I put up a posting for, like, a, a, some PHP developers for a, a project I worked on, and I was the, the lead engineer, so it was my job to pick out the people right. uh, for the, to be the PHP programmers. And I got a bunch of resumes from people that didn't write PHP because they didn't read the just job description at all. 
And then they just, you know, he's like, I can program all these other languages. And it's like, yeah. And it's like, or, you know, here I have a letter of, recommenda- re- a letter of recommendation for when I worked at Ford. It's like, sure, you developed apps internally at Ford, but you didn't write yeah. PHP. You're of no use to me. <laughs> Bottom of the pile with you. Bottom to the yeah. pile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, the interesting thing is that this year, uh, Red Hat intends to hire 900 to 1,000 more people. I saw that. Well, they're making a ton of money. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're primarily good. looking for software engineers and technical support people, but also some salespeople to help drive their cloud technology stuff. I think I could be a Red Hat salesman. I mean, I could be a Red Hat tech, but I think I'd almost rather be a Red Hat salesman, get to travel around the world selling Linux. I could get behind yeah, that. Yeah, and, you know. I do that now, except for I don't travel. <laughs> you could actually talk about the cloud stuff without <laughs> right. just spouting off meaningless metaphors and stuff. Maybe. Or I could just sort of embrace it and just, you know, go crazy. Like right. Kind of, but. There's a difference between someone that actually has enough of the technical background to be able to tell what the cloud actually does and not just have this vague concept of what it is and then selling it anyway. You know, I kid, but I actually, towards uh, the end of my contracting, when I did contract work for a company instead of just contracting directly myself, they kind of moved me into a lead technical sales uh, role. And I actually kind of enjoyed it because if you do understand the technology and you have the ability to communicate, which I can do semi well, uh, yeah. then, you know, it actually is a pretty good position for people. So if, you know, if yeah, seriously, Red Hat sales are probably actually a pretty good job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, you would, <clears throat> the other thing is, you know, especially if you're a little bit more on the technical side or if the job position is a little more on the technical side, ra- rather than just sales, it's more like a solution developer kind of thing, yeah. is that your job is basically to go around to different companies find out what their problem is, in broad strokes, sort out what the solution would be, you know, which products to put together to make it to solve the problem, mm-hmm. and then someone else has to come and build it, and you get to move on. And, and do the, So that, it's just this constant set of unique challenges. That was what I liked about it exactly. Yeah. That's exactly you know, what that, I liked about That's it. why I like my job as like the lead technical guy when I worked at Wagos was I you know, kind of figure out what the problems are, come up with the vague solution, like the right. overviews of what the solution would be, yeah. write some very specific code for the parts that I wanted done. Like, right. you know, I, wanted, I wrote the password hashing stuff myself because I didn't trust anyone else to do it right. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. But then the rest of it was all delegated and, see, you know, and then I moved on. And, you know, they have developers still working on the site or whatever, and I just have like a maintenance role. You get to do your own thing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But yes, um, you know, cool. basically a constant supply of fresh challenges is... A great way, you know, especially if you've worked as like a developer or a tech support guy for a long time and you're feeling burnt out, it this is that constant supply of fresh stuff to do mm-hmm. and you know, maybe get to travel some and so on. Yeah, so, it's not bad. P- chat room, yeah. chat room's kind of hating on it. Anomaly says sales equals lies, but really, it's it, there's a different category for technical sales that is actually yeah. pretty rewarding. Uh, Alan, why don't we get to our first question? It was submitted to the TechSnap subreddit, and it is an interesting one. It's about using, uh, rolling your own SSL cert for, say, home use, personal use. Yep. And he said, I'd love to hear some info from TechSnap on using SSL at home for services like OwnCloud, Subsonic, and PFSense. Is it okay to make your own certificate, and how would I implement it, and so on? What do you think of this, Alan? Uh, uh, Yeah, you can, you know, the certificate system is set up so that anyone can sign a certificate. Uh, It just comes down to who do you trust uh, the signatures of. By default, your browser trusts a bunch of these big certificate authorities, but if you make your own certificate authority, you can install that uh, public key into your browser, and your browser will trust it, as if it was you know, one from GoDaddy or someone. Yeah. And uh, Now it means every time a stranger goes to it for the first time, they're going to get an alert. They'll get a the big scary warning. So if it's just for you, it's fine. Otherwise, it's not. Uh, Stefan and I used to complain uh, the college for its internal LMS, had a self-signed certificate. Because especially this was like uh, a few years before SSL certificates got a lot cheaper. Yeah, oh, so yeah. getting one was like $1,000. And, and we didn't now, have go now they it off have, too. Right. And now they just have, you can get wildcard certificates that cover yeah. all the subdomains on your domain. Yeah. Uh, which is something this guy might want to look into. There was a period of time where self-signed was way more common. Yeah. Way more common because of the price. I, I didn't yeah. even think of that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big uh, deal. But yeah, like w- for one of my applications that I wrote, it was all, uh, it has, the, the website itself had a real SSH key, mm-hmm. but it also used a self-signed one internally because every user of the application was issued a client certificate. They would install that in their browser and that would allow their browser to prove to the web app that they are who they say they are. Wow. And that was part of the authentication. Ah. 
So on top of a password, you had to have an SSL certificate that proved you were the you the client are who you say you are, right? Because SSL can work both ways, right? In most terms, we think about it as the server proving to us that it's really PayPal.com or whatever. But you can have a certificate that proves that you as the client are someone and you're proving your identity to the server. Right? So you can actually have that work both ways. Uh, in fact, PayPal does that. Uh, if you're using their API, one of the ways you can do that is they will issue you a PayPal signed certificate and you pr- use that to prove to PayPal uh, that you are the client that's allowed to make this API call. Um, so OpenSSL comes with a little ca.pl script, a little Perl script for managing your own little homegrown CA. Uh, it works fine if you only have 10 or 20 certificates you really need to manage or whatever. There you go. That's probably perfect. All right. Very good stuff. Good luck with that uh, Bortified, I believe was his name in the uh, subreddit. All right, Alan. But yeah, someone in the subreddit pointed out that uh, you can get a, a properly signed certificate for home use for free from Startcom. Mm-hmm. Okay. There you go. Well, that works too. One more uh, thread from the subreddit. Uh, it's questioning the uh, the correct horse battery staple password that we've uh, talked about where getting a random sentence like that put together can often make a great password. He says, and I just thought this was an interesting discussion. I didn't really have much to add to it. He says, I guess you've all seen the X- X- KCD comic that we've talked about in the show. But he says, is there really that much uh, entropy in four random words? Bad guys have dictionaries too, you know. I guess there are more words than characters, but I'd still like to know how it stacks up compared to, say, a truly random password with, say, 11 characters. And I love this because uh, Ket Flo- Floof in the uh, subreddit went and actually just went and did the math real quick. Yeah. <laughs> he broke it all down right there. And in summary, uh, four words, maybe not, but five words, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I added to the subreddit pointing out, uh, as we talked about a couple episodes ago in TechSnap, you have to make sure that the words are not forming a sentence. They have right. to be random words. Right. Uh, because when they form a sentence, the key space gets reduced. Well, you know, once you're at five words... Uh, you've already eliminated like 87% of all the possibilities because, you know, they basically took the rules of grammar and said, you know, with these three words, the next word can only be this subset of possible words, right? And so they wrote their own password cracking program based on the concept that people write sentences, not just random words. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure you're using random words that don't grammatically make sense together. And to kind of help people out, you've linked to a whiteboard session on password security tips and best practices. Yeah, this is uh, kind of related. It's just uh, Rapid7 is the company behind uh, Metasploit and uh, Nexpos and so on. Oh, yeah. Uh, And, you know, we've talked about their research and stuff, you know, almost every week for the last couple of weeks because they were heavily involved in the Java stuff and and other stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Ruby as well, the Ruby stuff. They oh, were, yeah, yeah. They had the Metasploit Jeez. modules for it. These guys are and, on fire. Yeah, so th- they have this feature called Whiteboard Wednesdays where every Wednesday they you know, doodle something on a whiteboard, but this one was about uh, passwords. It's fairly basic stuff that probably everybody's already heard, but it was a good video to point other people to. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. put that in your, uh, like your pin board or your bookmarks and send that off to somebody when they're struggling with their password. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, this next email came from Aaron, and this is so cool because he bought a domain for us. He says, I can't believe you guys didn't buy patch your S, of course he spells it out, dot com, dot org, or dot net, and have them redirect to the TechSnap page. So uh, he says he fixed that for us, and if either of us want them, just let him know. But I think it's great. He says he also says thanks to Alan for answering his ZFS disk exercise question on a recent show. I yep. love it when people buy domains and then point them at us because it's A, a great way to support our sponsor and B, a great way to help us with SEO. I mean, it's just, yep. it's cool. And great name. That's a great, I yes, can't believe I we didn't know, have that. I, yeah, we need to, I should all email him back. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, so the next uh, email came from Alexander, and he has a question about backing up Gmail. I'm looking for a way to back up emails from Gmail and other email services. I'd preferably want to use command line tools since I'm going to use this with a cron job and possibly it'll be on my server. I'd also like the backups to be easily restorable. Would Gitmail be the best choice for this? If so, how would I restore? And thanks. What do you think about backing up email? Um, the easiest, if you have IMAP access like you can get with Gmail, that's the best way because it allows you to read and write so you can restore it that way as well. Mm-hmm. Although, I'm not sure how you, would, how you would need to restore email to Gmail, but uh, you know, it would work with other services as well. Hmm. That's, that's why I use IMAP because I can, I've literally done that where I've moved emails from one server to another by just dragging and dropping them in my, in my mail client. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and you have a script here, a Python script that uh, backs up your 
Yeah, uh, from you know. from uh, viewer of the show over Raimi.org, he has a noprivpy It's a IMAP email backup to HTML archive. I've actually talked about it on last before. It's a Python script. It's command line. You can cron it, and uh, it connects to your IMAP server, pulls everything down into an HTML5 browsable archive and index, breaks out each folder, gives you uh, you know a really, really nice front end to going through all of this. But the other thing that's really cool is instead of having to go to HTML files if you don't want, and here I'm showing some screenshots in the in the video, Video version, you can also have it back up to MBOX format. So then you could just open uh, it up like in Thunderbird or whatever you might yep. want to use, and you could restore it that way. Yeah, I prefer MailDir over MBOX because MBOX basically is storing all of your mail in a single file or each directory anyway. Oh, in I'm a sorry, file. He's, he is using MailDir. Ah, MailDir is storing each message as a separate file. So at at um, in a worst case scenario, you can literally just like less each of these files and read the HTML with your eyeballs. Yeah. I've, I've done that before. You know, if you've ever had to poke around in a mail queue, you're used to it. But yeah, I've like gone through a mail there and like read mail before. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of times it's happened, you know, you're fixing your customer's mail server and you have to reset a password and you have to go into their mail there and read the password reset emails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I have a war story about that, but I don't know if I should share it. I mean, the statute of limitations has probably passed, but I had a, I, we had an exchange outage one time, and uh, yeah, I'll, maybe one day I'll share it on yeah. the show. But anyways, go check that out. Yeah, we have that uh, linked in the show. So notes. if it can store it to Mailder, then you can mm-hmm. basically drop that in a directory and run your own mail server and be able to point your client at that yeah, and or there's, have full access to it. There's a ton of to. mail clients that will just read it, too, just yeah. straight up and just pull it right into the mail client. Yeah, well, uh, your like, command line mail clients will be able to read the Mailder, no problem. And... Uh, uh, and you know, if you have it as a mailer, you should be able to push it back over IMAP into the uh, the mail account as well. Yeah. Um, or uh, what I've done for some clients is we just have like a backup archive IMAP server, and you just yeah. could move that mailer onto that. But all right. Yeah. Well, because the other the, the the main reason why I've mentioned mailer there uh, instead of a mail uh, an inbox where it's yeah. storing each directory as a file yeah. is if you're doing incremental backups with something like Bacula, mm. because each email is a separate file. Right. It can just back up the new ones, whereas when they're all in one, each directory is one file, you have to back up that whole file every time. That'd be good for storing in a Dropbox, too. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you had enough Dropbox, Dropbox or anything that deduplicates yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but mostly the main thing here is that, you yeah, know, if you're doing incremental backups of this dump of your mail, mm-hmm. then it's not going to take up as much space because you're actually going to be able to incremental it, whereas when it's all in one file, you can't. It's that whole file gets, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, should we uh, jump to Stefan's email? Sure. Stefan writes in with a few questions, Alan. He says, hey, guys, I've been listening to Jupiter Broadcasting for a few months now. He started with Coder Radio, and he's in charge of redeveloping a PHP website for a local nonprofit group. They already have an application on the web, but there's, uh, and there's a standard login area. A few weeks ago, he discovered he could perform a SQL injection attack on it. He logged in with himself first without a password, and then as the club president with only knowing his email address. Now I bring this up because I just listened to TechSnap73, the 00 Java episode, and you mentioned OpenID. I was wondering if there was any advantage to using OpenID when the website I'm developing for will not have SSL. Um, uh, yes. Uh, basically, OpenID would log in would be an SSL still, wouldn't it? Right. So, yeah, exactly. So, uh, when people go to your website and they're submitting their username and password, that's going over the internet in the clear, meaning someone could capture it on, on the client side or the server side, right? A man in the middle type attack. Um, Whereas with OpenID, it's going to go over SSL, so their username and password is going to be encrypted as it goes over the internet. So if you don't have SSL, you may want to consider uh, using something like OpenID. Uh, you know, the risk is what we just talked about with Facebook, mm-hmm. right? If OpenID has an outage, you might have a problem. Yeah. Uh, although OpenID is less of a single point of failure because there are multiple OpenID providers. Right. Right. Uh, the problem would be, you know, most people don't have their OpenID from OpenID. They have it from some specific site. Most people don't so have an OpenID. That's the problem. Um, yeah. It's too bad that I didn't take off more. Yeah. Uh, or that you know, someone like Google or Facebook didn't make your login ID work with OpenID. Well, you know, some, some services, what they do is they just use multiple different login providers. They'll have Google yeah. authentication, Twitter authentication, OpenID. Uh, uh, Stack Exchange does that. Yeah. And that, that's kind of sort of distributing your risk, I guess. Yeah. Although I don't, I, I wonder if they had the problem with Facebook Connect. I don't think so because they don't run the Facebook Connect code until you hit login and choose which provider to try. Yeah. So they might not have been affected by that. Yeah. 
That's I'm not also sure. interesting. It's an interesting question. He co- he follows up with uh, also. Do you know any PHP hosting for servers that have? You know, he's looking for free. Uh, with up-to-date Apache, PHP, and MySQL, the server currently being hosted is very outdated. It's running PHP 5.2.1.7, MySQL 5.1, with Apache 2.2.1.9. He says, I know GoDaddy, for example, uh, is our domain registrar, but we're using double O or triple O web host to actually host it. I think I should also mention the reason I want more up-to-date PHP is because I'm using Cake PHP Framework, and as a version 2.0.5, they no longer are supporting double double zero web host versions of PHP. Hmm. Yeah. See, um, what's really challenging here about this is people look for specific versions on web hosts, but a lot of times these web hosts are running like CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise, and they're they're maintaining a patched version of PHP, but they could be right. several revs behind. Same with MySQL. So it could be right. So yeah, like they uh, their PHP isn't necessarily old and insecure. It's got the security patches, just not. Um, it doesn't increment the version number because Red Hat's policy is. We're not going to change the version number of PHP because that might change some feature you use, and that would be bad. Hmm. I hear Zed hosting being recommended in the chat room. I don't know anything about I it. I don't know what to say. Uh, free hosting probably always sucks, so you are yeah, be better yeah. off just finding something cheap like GoDaddy yeah. uh, that you know, you're only paying a couple of dollars or whatever. Uh, and I just think you're better off paying you know, $2 a month than trying to find something free. Because so the free ones, even if they're half decent tend to get abused very badly yeah or just host thousands and thousands and thousands of sites so uh let's jump over to robert's question because he's trying out freebsd potentially inspired by the show but he's had some hardware troubles and he's wondering the best way to troubleshoot like for example during installation his onboard realtech nick hasn't shown up uh the ray controller does along with all the hard drives attached to it so that's good but if he can't get certain components working, he's kind of left high and dry. He's looking for ways to troubleshoot this, and uh, he's also experimented with FreeNAS, but thought maybe he'd go straight to FreeBSD. And he's wondering, Alan, if you have any recommendations as far as to what commands or logs to try to look into to figure out why certain things are not working. And um, by the way, so he loves the shows, watch all of them live while I work and when I can, and podcast when I can't. I use affiliate links when buying equipment for the office. Thank you, sir. And he says, keep up the great work. We need more people like you guys. Wow. Thanks, Robert. Um, so what, do you, what can he do like when somebody... The D message is obviously the most useful one for hardware D debug, message. but also okay. like PCI conf minus LV and so on. Um, it seems weird that the, he says the Nick doesn't show up in an installer, but it does when he boots off the already installed yeah. system, which yeah. that just seems very strange. You know, the kernel in the installer is slightly stripped down, but it wouldn't normally strip out support. Nick drivers, for, uh, right? A Nick driver. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that doesn't weird. seem right. Yeah. Um, it may be some kind of hardware conflict between his rate controller and his Nick. Uh, like apparently they're on the same IRQ or something. Mm-hmm. Might try to change it. Like if it's an option, try moving this the rate controller to a different PCI slot, and that will put it on a different IRQ, and that might make a difference. Um, beyond that, yeah, it's, you'd have to, you know, get the D message and the PCI conf minus LV, and compare the two between the BSD install and the, the installed system where you're booting off. And maybe, like he said, I think he was trying uh, FreeNAS 8.3, which is based on an older version of FreeBSD, but has some drivers from the newer version backported in, mm-hmm. um, especially for rate controllers and NICs. Um, you might want, if you can run that again, maybe uh, get the D message and PCI come from there and, and try to figure out where the difference is. Right. But seeing that's different. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe use a different nick until he gets the system up and online, if possible. That too. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Next email comes in from No Man's Land. He actually tried to hit us up on Twitter. I was like, ah, oh, this takes more of a longer answer than 140 characters. So emails, yeah. and he did. He says, "Hi guys, uh, I was told to get in touch over email. I've trolled the internet and the own cloud forums, but no luck on how to set up own cloud in a GoDaddy hosting account. The reason is I don't have a home server. I pay for deluxe hosting with GoDaddy. Uh, I want to use it any way I want to, and I don't have a static IP, so at home." And uh, I don't want to be tied to Dropbox or Google Drive or SkyDrive. He says, uh, I'm a novice. I don't really have any clue on how to set up Apache, PHP, or web dev. But I can do FTP and folders and create MySQL databases, like the one for WordPress. I think even if people have their own home server, a secondary remote server is necessary for backup. It's not a bad idea. And I'm in a pretty... and. Uh, in some, uh, in some, it's pretty. In summary, it's pretty much. If you can advise or make a YouTube video on steps to follow to achieve the reasonable result, that would be awesome. Many thanks. No man's land. So, I think the fundamental problem he's struggling with here is he's unfamiliar with some of the key technologies he needs to set this up. Yep. And that's kind uh, of my impression. And 
the, the, that's the problem I have is I've never actually looked into OwnCloud. I thought it was its own daemon, but it seems it's some PHP scripts. And so... Yeah, it, it depends d- on how you set it up. That moves from the but, realm of impossible to do on shared hosting to possible. Yeah. But I don't know that much about it. You know what I would recommend uh, for No Man's Land is, and I've linked this in the show notes if he wants to go grab this, is just to familiarize yourself with the underlying technology, go grab a VM. They, they make it available for download. You could throw it in VirtualBox or anything that you want. They have a virtual image right here. You can go grab it just to play with it on your own computer. Get VMware Player or VirtualBox. Uh, also, I've linked a, a blog post on OwnCloud site that tells you how to go from the download file of that VM image to actually have it running in like two minutes. So give that a read. And then thirdly, I've linked a forum post, once you have all that stuff figured out, in the OwnCloud forums on setting up OwnCloud on GoDaddy shared hosting. And they give you the folders you need to create in FTP. And all the, the rewrite rules you need. The rewrite rules, the, all that stuff. So go follow those links because once you get the fundamentals figured out, it'll be really easy to translate that to a hosting environment. And the VM will let you sort of... The, the re- great thing about the VM is you can set it up, you can get the setup wrong, you can make mistakes, all of that's just fine because then when you go to deploy your actual production version, you figured out some of the basics first and it's not your first yep. time doing it. <clears throat> Alan, I think that's all the emails for this week, isn't it? Uh, yep. All right, so you can email us, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop that contact link or start a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv and we want your questions so that way we can answer them next week on air. Anything you got... But Alan, with the emails all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup are stories that didn't quite fit at the top of our show, but we still wanted to talk about them. Maybe give you some links to follow up at the end of our show. And oftentimes, they're provided by our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Mr. Jude, this one was one of the top voted stories in our subreddit this week, and it really applies to uh, those of us in the United States. Looks like CISPA's making a comeback. Yep. CISPA, of course, is the Cyber Information Security and Protection Act, and uh, the uh, primary goal behind CISPA is to enable private corporations to collaborate with government uh, in under the generic umbrella of cybersecurity awareness, and they are indemnified from revealing personal information about you or something like that. So say your ISP might start logging everywhere you visit, and then if they hand that over to the government, you have no legal repercussions for the violation of your privacy. Now, this is uh, stacked on top of an executive order that President Obama signed the day of a State of the Union. That is actually already in effect. uh, What was that, Tuesday? Uh, that that went Wednesday that went into effect here in the United States. Uh, I'm going to cover what the impact of that is politically in this week's episode of Unfilter, episode 37. So we're tracking, I'm doing something interesting. We're tracking the technical element of CISPA here and the political element of uh, CISPA in Unfilter because it's got big ramifications in both. But this CISPA is rumored to have a little less bite, but they have not, we have not actually seen it yet. We don't know the details, but supposedly they're trying to smooth out some of the things that people had issue with. But overall, what the first impressions are that people have seen is it's essentially a rehash from what we saw last year. Yep. Yay! We knew this would be back. I mean, we knew that. Yep. All right, Alan, next story in the roundup is yours, sir. Yes. Uh, Deloitte is suggesting that uh, passwords are going to have to be longer. Uh, starting in 2013, which is correct. Uh, basically, an eight-character password is not sufficient anymore. So, you know, sites and services need to start changing their password policies to uh, require a password that is longer than eight characters. Yeah, it's not... Uh, and I can see where this is going to pose a problem in some cases. For example, my online banking has a limit of 12 characters. You can't go over 12 characters. And, you know, for your online banking, maybe the minimum should be at least 10 and more like 12 and so that kind of doesn't leave a range anymore, does it? No. Yeah, they really got to step it up, don't they? They really need to. So we talk about the perfect password a lot, don't we? But uh, there was a study that was recently done that shows the top 10,000 passwords. Right. Uh, so, yeah, in the recent study, they uh, took 6 million passwords that people had tried to use mm-hmm. for stuff. Yeah. And they ran that against the 10,000 most common passwords. Okay. And they found that 98.1% of what people had picked in the 6 million passwords <laughs> were in that top 10,000 most popular passwords. Ah, uh, silly humans. So only 2% of people are using a password that isn't on a very short dictionary list. Come on, guys. Come well, on. Uh, I don't know where their source for that 6 million passwords was, um, but they had some 
horrible statistics like uh, 9.8 percent of people entered a password of one two three four five six or one two three four five six seven eight. First of all, six characters shouldn't even be allowed. Uh, so you know, I'm questioning where they got this data from, but yeah, yeah, that's pretty insane. Yeah, and uh, you know, 4.7 percent of users tried to use the password just password. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> and uh, the top 500 passwords accounted for 79% of all passwords. Oh, the top 1,000 was 91%. And then top 10,000, uh, basically if you add it all together, you end up with 98.8% of all users. Uh, so there were 6 million passwords. 2.3 million uh, of those were unique. <laughs> Uh, but the belong to only one point one eight percent of the users. I'm poor. I might be part of the point one eight percent. Is what you're telling me? Yes. Wow. I feel privileged all of a sudden. Yeah. My my status yeah, in life. Yeah. Only one percent of people have a good password. It seems. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Well, uh, if you know anybody that has the password of password or password one two three, you can help them, and help the internet. All right, uh, this next story got my attention. I actually don't normally follow car news, but I, I, when, it, when it gets electronics with Tesla, the two things converge, and now you have my interest. So I read this New York Times review that came out this weekend, and it was scathing. It was uh, A driver was on the East Coast in the hard weather, had horrible battery uh, performance in, in the Tesla Model S that he was driving, and uh, Tesla took major issue, Alan. I don't know if you saw this, but they, they felt they were so wronged in this New York Times review, they've released the logs from the driver's car because they lent him the car. And whenever they lend a car to yep. media, they turn on logging. And they discovered, like, he was driving around in circles and parking lots trying to bring the battery down when he never claimed that in his review. Uh, he who drove right past charging stations that he could have stopped at to charge up and, and all this kind of stuff. And Tesla is taking it to the web with... Infogram, uh, info charts, diagrams. Uh, I mean, they're really trying to combat the bad PR that they've gotten. And it's interesting because secondarily, there's been this explosion of, well, what kind of data are you guys collecting on your drivers? You have a lot of information here. And Tesla Motors has stepped up and said, we only turn this on for media professionals because they do this to us. <laughs> they, yeah. they screw uh, us. Because this isn't the first time Tesla has done this. Uh, they tried to sue the BBC because Top Gear said some negative things about the the Tesla car because uh, it broke down while they were testing it. Something tells me the truth lies somewhere in between. Like, I bet the battery didn't perform as well when it was freezing cold outside. Right. Well, that's just the nature of batteries. There's not anything anyone can really do about that. But yeah, at the same time, you know, if the guy was driving around in circles and parking lots to run down the battery, that's, you know. Yeah. 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 And especially when he said it was already dead. And yeah. I think what it was is it got to 0%. And he was like, well, how much, how long? He was like Kramer in this thing. How long yeah. can I drive when it's on 0%? Well, you don't want to be on the road when it's on 0% either, right? Right. So, so this guy had bad testing. This guy had bad testing and documentation of his testing. And now he's getting railed for it. And he also, I guess, uh, somebody on the internet went through and looked at his previous writings and 80, 87% of them, like on the New York Times, are like big oil, pro big oil <laughs> stories. Mm, yeah. <laughs> So. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely fault on both sides of this. <laughs> yeah. One. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, this is uh, we teased it earlier in the show, but there's a really interesting article about the malware industrial complex, and the thing that they bring up in this story that I find to be really concerning is they point out that the end result of all of this is going to be a more dangerous web for everyone. Yeah. Uh, basically, you know, this is the like we've talked about Vupen and some others who would find these vulnerabilities and then sell them to the government. And so now we're looking at defense contractors getting into the same thing, sitting there hacking at software like Adobe Flash and Java's Oracle and so on. Are we going to hear uh, the term Oracle's militarized Java. malware soon, do you think? I, I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, basically they're after zero days so they can write malware that can be used against you know, current software. And the main issue here versus regular researchers is they have a vested interest in not telling the vendor like Adobe mm -hmm. uh, about the vulnerability. Right. So, you know, in a, in a potential future, Lockheed Martin finds an exploit for Flash, and rather than telling Adobe about it, getting a fix done, and everybody's Flash gets patched, they keep it secret, wait until the government needs to hack somebody's computer, and then sells them that exploit for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that's your tax money being used to buy viruses to compromise your computer, to compromise your privacy. 
Uh, next story is kind of interesting. We've talked a lot about what happens when uh, hackers break into news outlets and then distribute false information on trusted yep. sites. Well, yes. do you see the story about uh, hackers that broke into TV networks and ran yep. zombie alerts about a zombie invasion? Yeah, now, so they, they broke into the TV's uh, emergency <laughs> alert system, uh, which, you know, if you were alive in the early 90s, <laughs> you remember these. They test them all the time when you're uh, terrestrial TV, uh, and it'd be like you know this horrible screeching sound a couple of times. And they're like, "This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. If yeah. this wasn't a test, there would be instructions here. But this is a test, so just ignore us." Do you want me to play it? I could play it. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, uh, I uh, I thought you know at first when I first heard about this, I thought this is a this was a plug for the new uh, what's that zombie show called? Um, I thought it was like an ad, but uh, it actually happened to multiple stations, I guess, too. Yeah. So the first question is, why are these emergency alert systems connected to the internet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? That is a really good question. Well, I can see somebody's point of, you know, it's easier for us to trigger the alerts in all the places that need them and not the places that don't, so on, by just clicking a button rather than mm. having to phone some people or something. Mm. But, you know, and if it's just over the phone, technically it's probably easier to prank call one of these people if you know the number and get an alert sent out. Although... If there's a human involved, they're going to know that, you know, zombies is not a real alert. <laughs> well, <Right>? I, <laughs> there's also the story that uh, the, there's some Canadian readiness drill that they were doing for a zombie. It was, everybody just loves zombies, Alan. Everybody loves zombies. So, of course, it's zombies. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I just I think that is so funny. Uh, the next story is, uh, this one surprised the hell out of me. Hackers exposed Bush family emails, including photographs um, and uh, George W. Bush's uh, skills as a painter. <laughs> Did you see this? I was very afraid when I read the description of uh, his self-portrait of him in the shower. Yeah, he did a self-portrait of himself in the shower. Uh, it is it is yes. weird to look at these. I, I kind of feel dirty doing it. So, uh, anyways, yeah. you guys can go read it if you want. But yeah, photos it seems they, they broke into at least one email account, got the private email addresses of a bunch of people, and then uh, subsequently maybe broke into some additional accounts. Yeah. yeah. And it just goes yeah. to show you need long, strong passwords on your email. Your email account is the most important password. Yeah, it was their personal accounts. It's not like they were U.S. government accounts, but the Secret no. Service is now looking into it. So, I mean, you go right. after the Bush family, you're going to have Secret yeah. Service because both Bush Jr. and Bush Jr. were presidents of the United States. And, yeah. uh, you know, I guess the worst case is nothing Well, because one of the other leaked. things there was one of the pictures was uh, a hospital visit for yeah. George Bush Sr. Yeah. that wasn't public information. Like, nobody had, it, it didn't make right. the news that he had been to the hospital. Uh, uh, or or uh, the, the paintings. Now, Matthew is complaining because we linked to a, a, a Daily Mail. Uh, this story is not just being well, run. Well, it's at, a tabloid. Of yeah. course, the tabloid yeah. is exactly. the one that bought the pictures. Exactly. <laughs> They're the ones that bought the pictures, so we link them if you want them. Uh, you can also find the pictures of uh, uh, W's uh, paintings if you want. Yeah, and there's one there of uh, um, Bill Clinton and a young George Bush. I mean, sure, he established the Patriot Act and he read your emails, but that does not give you enough reason to go read his emails. I say leave the poor guy alone. Yes. Let him paint in peace. <laughs> All right. Uh, next story on the Roundup, Alan. Uh, one encrypted media extension document, EME. What the, on the, what is EME? I don't even know what this is. Yeah, uh, basically the W3C, which is the organization responsible for developing HTML5, yeah? has ruled that DRM is now in scope for HTML5. What? What does that DRM is in scope? Yes. Uh, so basically, HTML5 is going to have some kind of DRM solution. Uh, I think this is their furtherance to replace Flash. Or yeah. Something. yeah uh, because a bunch of companies like Microsoft and, interesting, Netflix, right? Netflix wants some way mm, to DRM their Netflix video without having to use like Silverlight. Yeah. Because if, if there was some HTML5 standard, it would work in every browser instead of requiring Silverlight, and it would work on mobile devices, and there would be less work for them. Mm-hmm. I'm just not sure, you know, when we're putting DRM in open standards, it gets kind of, it's, you know, this hinkiness that I'm not yeah. sure about. Yeah, I don't like that very much. Uh, this next story caused a little dust up on Google Plus this week when uh, yeah. <laughs> Google announced via their Chrome project that they considered Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, 6. to be obsolete and they weren't going to yes. be issuing new Chrome updates for it. 
Yeah. Now, uh, there's a bit more reasoning behind it that makes more sense once okay. you dig into it. But yeah, uh, because the interesting Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 is the newest version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Right, right. Uh, and like we talked a little about a little bit before, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, when they start, you know, they have version 5 and then version 6, and there's subversions. But in the main versions, they don't change the version of the apps that are included, right? You know, like uh, CentOS 5 and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 came with MySQL 5.0. They would patch it for vulnerabilities, but they would never upgrade to 5.1, mm -hmm. right? In Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, they upgraded to 5.1, right? And now for the entire life of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, it'll always be MySQL 5.1. Right. Because that way, when you're writing an app or something, you can trust that the version of MySQL isn't randomly going to change on you like it would in, say, Debian. Mm-hmm. Or, or Arch or some other you know, more bleeding edge type distribution. The problem is Google Chrome has basically switched to relying on C++11 and GCC 4.6. But Red Hat Enterprise Linux is never going to have GCC 4.6. Right? They won't upgrade their version of GCC until Red Hat Enterprise 7, right. which probably won't come out for like another five years. Uh, it's close. Right? It's close. Is it? Yeah. Is, well, because... I think it's close. I might be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I think I, I think it's still a couple of years away. Okay. I'll look while you talk. And basically, um, Google's saying it's a lot of work to maintain Chrome for this older version that doesn't support the new compiler. Basically, the new code won't compile. Uh, now, if Chrome is being distributed as a binary anyway, it can't be that hard to compile it on GCC 4.6. <laughs> Red Hat uh, 7 is due sometime in 2013. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe they, you know. But basically declaring obsolete before the old, the new version is out is kind of, you know, uh, being ahead of the curve a bit, right? Mm -hmm. It's leaving uh, these people with no option. Uh, but yeah, it seems like, you know, a uh, binary should work just fine, right? So, like, Red Hat could package up a newer version that was compiled on a machine that has a newer GCC, you would think. Although maybe it relies on some other libraries that won't be there. So, so now, but then they then they really issued an update saying that they don't consider it a, uh, obsolete, right? Uh, they say uh, here that no, a Google they, developer they just explained it that they need GCC four point six. Oh and yeah, Red Hat doesn't have that, so yep. they can't have Chromium. Yep, I see it. Google Google Chrome has stopped updating and will no longer support this version of your operating system. Uh, we're going to show on a number of Linux versions that we won't be supported as of Chrome twenty seven is the last version that will support. Red Hat Enterprise. Well, not that many people use. Well, actually, that's some production shops do use Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Well, a lot desktop. of workstations. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, well, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is only for servers. Like, no, right. a lot of people use it on workstations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, because also, interestingly, for the FIPS certification, for being like uh, supporting super encryption and so on, uh, to be used in the government for certain secure work, mm -hmm. only Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 has ever been certified. The process takes so long that 6 hasn't been certified yet. And so some places it can only use Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5. Right? I, I would say, you know, there's probably, um, there's probably going to be less and less people because this, this is one of the problems Red Hat Enterprise Linux has is it, well, I guess it depends on your environment. I mean, Chrome, I mean, the thing is, is Chrome is not like a deal breaker for running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 on the desktop because you could just use Firefox or one of the yeah. other browsers available. So it's not like it's, yeah. it doesn't really move the needle in any direction. Not really. No. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the roundup stories that, uh, yep. that we had. But I wanted to point people to the Pirate Bay uh, TBP AFK, which is available for free up on YouTube. It is. Uh, it's yes. not in English, but it is a documentary oh. on uh, the Pirate Bay case. Fascinating bits of uh, background story on the Pirate Bay, the handoff of the Pirate Bay, uh, what happened to those original guys. Um, yep. uh, it, the, the, it's, there's there's information about how they scaled the servers. They kind of allude to how they hide servers. Um, they they a lot of a lot of gratuitous shots of their data center with the original Pirate Bay servers and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely some good stuff for uh, for uh, gearheads. But Alan, uh, I just want to give a quick reminder. We do have the TechSnap uh, 100 T-shirt that'll be available for 19 more days, and then uh, after that, never available again. So go yeah. grab that over at Teespring.com/slash/TechSnap100 and celebrate 100 episodes of the TechSnap program in style. And uh, Alan, you know why it's uh, blue? 
Uh, no, other th- other than the fact that blue is my favorite color, I didn't. I picked blue because it's my favorite color. Because it's ice cold cool like you, Alan. That's why. Ah. That's why. All right. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of this week's episode of Tech Snap. Alan, thank you, sir, for the great show, and thank you to everyone for tuning to this week's episode of Tech Snap. And we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>